How are we doing here this morning, everybody? Kind of a short roster here today. Give everybody a few minutes about getting in here, and then we'll get started. All right, we might as well get started. Now that Teresa's here, we can finally get ourselves going. So we uh, we can get started on this sort of stuff. So um, what we're going to do today, we're going to start um, kind of going through the introduction stuff to the lumbopelvic region. Um, this is kind of typically the stuff that we would do Friday afternoon um, during the, the module. Um, the hope is, is that we'll be able to uh, get a little more lab time um, when we're when we're going through this stuff ahead of time. Um, We'll see if we have to refer back to this stuff um, during the during the course itself, um, which is definitely a possibility. Um, but so we'll get into you know kind of why uh, the lumbo lumbo pelvic region is difficult to treat, um, why it's important. Obviously, there's a lot of reasons for that, and then how it's different from treating, say, just the thorax or just the lumbar spine or just the cervical spine. So, a lot of different things that we have to kind of take into consideration. Um, when we're doing this sort of stuff. Before I get too far into this, do we have, everybody can see my screen? Are you seeing the PowerPoint here? Anybody? Yep, looks good. Yeah. You got it? Okay, good. All right, so here we go. All right, so for me, when we look at the lumbopelvic region, and again, just as a uh, kind of a definition here, you know, what, what do we consider the lumbopelvic region? You know, we have to take into consideration with this, um, the lower thoracic spine. Okay. So TL junction, we have to take into consideration the, uh, lumbar segments themselves, the pelvis. Uh, so the sacroiliac joints, pubic symphysis, et cetera, the hip itself, um, all would be considered a portion of the lumbopelvic region. Um, and that, you know, again, that's that's pretty much it as to why this is so difficult to treat, because it can be affected by so many other body regions. Um, we can have issues as far down as the um, first metatarsal, right, um, or in the first MTP that will potentially affect the lumbopelvic uh, mechanism, right? So that is a fairly daunting type of thought when we when we start seeing somebody come in with, um, you know, what we would call lumbopelvic pain. Um, it's, it, it tends to make us concerned about, well, you know, where are we really getting all these issues? Where are they coming from? Right. And that's our etiology, um, is really what we're looking for there. The diagnosis 
again, in most cases, the way I think of it is what's our pain producer? What, what tissue in the body is actually painful? Um, and what's the stress that's causing that tissue to become painful? Um, the etiology then would be uh, essentially the driving mechanism that put excessive stress on that painful tissue and caused it to break down. Okay. So again, just like it says here, it definitely makes it difficult to find potential etiologies um, that could be leading to, or even just contributing to the dysfunction that the patient is having. Okay. So why is it important? Well, there's a lot of reasons, right? So stable base for gait, um, this is something that we can test for um, using the Portland test. Um, I don't know. I think I did show it to you guys when we were when I was out there for the module three class um, as a screening test. If not, if I if I didn't, I'm just confusing myself here. We will show it to you um, in module five here coming up in a few weeks. Basically, what it is is it's a loading test for the pelvis. Okay, so we put the person into a stride stance. We put a load across the pelvis. Basically, we press into the sacroiliac joint. Um, there's some specifics that, uh, as far as how the test is described, that are supposed to make it more effective. Honestly, I have found that this is one of the most effective tests, regardless of some of those specifics. Um, as far as screening tests goes, that tell us there's something not right at that particular sacroiliac region, um, whether it's right or left. Um, and it doesn't doesn't give us the uh, you know exact diagnosis of what's going on with it. It just tells us that we need to go in and do a much more in depth um, examination of that area. Okay, so that's a very good test, and we'll we'll talk more about it as we get as we get through the actual course module. Um, Lumbopelvic region is also the region that houses the driving mechanisms for initiating and maintaining gait. Um, that would be the psoas major and the glute max. Um, if we look at so is major as probably the primary um, driving mechanism for gait. Um, what it does specifically to the lumbopelvic mechanism is it, if we think of the attachment points of the psoas, right? So it's coming coming off of the front side of the transverse processes and vertebral body um, bilaterally. What it'll do as the psoas contracts is it will put the lumbar spine into extension ipsilateral side bending and contralateral rotation. Okay. So think about the transverse process being pulled forward. Um, so if you think about the right transverse process being pulled forward, relatively speaking, it's going to go forward um, compared to the left side, that would be a left rotation. Okay. So we would have extension, right side bending, left rotation um, generated by that. And that is exactly what happens when we are ambulating. All right. So again, we talked about functional coupling through the thorax and through the lumbar spine, or at least through the TL junction region during the thoracic course. Um, and this is why we look at latexion as being the more functional of the two combined movements um, between it and rotexion um, because of gait, because essentially latexion is the movement that is propagated via contraction of the, of the psoas major during um, ambulation. Okay, so that's definitely something that we have to take in consideration as far as how that's going to affect things. Okay, um, Humans do have the most efficient form of gait of any li living organism on the planet. Okay, It's really actually kind of cool stuff if you want to nerd out on it a little bit like I do. Um, the idea is that the body is able to produce passive energy um, via the elasticity of various structures within the body. So if we're looking at things like um, capsular uh, tension, ligamentous tension, the bowing of certain bones like the fibula, for instance, um, all of the, the torsion that occurs through the discs of the lumbar spine, all of these things are like stretching out a rubber band, right? That we, we get this kind of inherent elasticity as these tissues stretch um, and what it does is as soon as the uh, stretch is released, right, which would tend to happen with heel rise or uh, swing phase, things like that during gait, is all of those elastic tissues, all of those mobile tissues recoil, okay? And that adds energy into the system that the body then does not have to produce with muscular effort, 
um, which to me is one of the coolest things when you think about um, how human beings are put together. Okay, so there's three things that allow us to do that um, as far as um, kind of morphological characteristics of the human body. The first one, um, if you want to look down at the notes there, is the lumbar lordosis, so the ability to get into a lumbar lordosis. Um, second one would be a hip that can extend beyond uh, the vertical plane, so into um, beyond beyond the neutral position. And then also the Q angle of the hip, which is what essentially narrows our base of support um, and allows internal rotation of the hip um, with hip extension and whatnot. So again, these are things that are just designed to create these torsional loads, create these torsional stretches on these various tissues throughout the body. And that allows us to generate um, much more effective passive energy. So you can start to see... Um, how some of these things can become problematic. You know, for instance, if we have somebody that's uh, very stenotic in the lumbar region and they don't, they're not able to get into a lumbar lordosis, um, or we have somebody that has a, a euphor lesion in the hip or a, you know, arthrosis in the hip and they're not able to get into hip extension, um, how that would affect the ability to produce this passive energy during gait. It would severely hinder our ability to do that. Um, so what, what has to happen? Well, we have to add that energy back into the system somehow. And the way that the body does that is with increasing muscular recruitment. So one thing that I see a ton of is I see, um, you know, like an irritated Achilles. So a tendinopathy of the Achilles. And essentially the idea is, is that as we move the ankle, uh, the talocural joint into a closed pack position. So into dorsiflexion and conjunct external rotation um, during striding, if we're unable to get there, right? So say we have an anteriorly sublux talus that's jammed up, it can't get into full dorsiflexion or even potentially full um, conjunct external rotation of the ankle. We can't flatten the foot out properly. We can't elongate the Achilles and the, and the uh, gastroc soleus complex um, effectively. And so we lose some of that passive energy generation. So now we have to push through the calf and use actual expended um, muscular effort to maintain the same level of energy expenditure so that we don't end up just walking in circles. Um, and that eventually will start to wear out either the Achilles itself or it'll start to develop um, nodules or trigger points within the within the gastroc or the soleus complex itself. Um, and so we see this a ton, you know, it's, I mean, it, that's, that's why that sort of thing starts to develop in the first place. And a lot of patients that come in with these uh, you know, Achilles tendinopathies. So it's the exact same thing as it relates to the lumbopelvic region. If we can't anteriorly rotate the innominate, you know, we have to then hyperextend or increase the lumbar lordosis. And at that point, we run the risk of starting to destabilize the lumbosacral junction, et cetera. You know, any, any one of these things, um, if they are limited, will start to put more stress on some associated structure within the same kinetic chain. And that's when things start to break down. Okay. That's a bit of a, oops, I'm doing something wrong here. Um, bit of a heavy um, concept, um, I suppose. Is there partic any particular questions about that specifically before we move on? Has anybody seen something in clinic where they would say, oh, you know what? I bet that's what's causing this issue with one of my patients. No, nothing. I have a question on the Q angle of the hip. I'm not sure exactly what that is. I don't remember um, what that is. Well, so it's it's the angulation between the um, neck of the femur and the shaft of the femur. Relative relative to the, a vertical plumb line. And then that just helps allow for more internal rotation when you extend. Yeah, so if you think about it, if okay. you look at somebody from behind when they walk, their feet tend to move toward midline, right? And then and we kind of swing the leg around the other leg as we go. Um, that's due to the Q angle because essentially the the um, the hang on, let me start my video here. If we're looking at somebody, if we if we look at the Q angle, 
the femoral neck comes out like this, and then the, the femur kind of comes medially as it comes back down. That's the cue angle relative to the vertical line straight up and down. So we have to kind of swing the legs in and out, and it allows for internal rotation of the coxofemoral joint, so the hip joint itself, um, with that. And that, again, that increases tension across the uh, ligamentous structure of the hip, the joint capsule itself, um, various muscles that cross that joint as well. So it, it allows us to passively elongate those tissues and then when they recoil they they spring loose of that stuff and it takes us um, back away from those closed pack positions so very effective stuff um, but that's that's definitely what we're looking at with that does that answer your question yeah I was just I just didn't know how it contributed to like the cold gate cycle perfect thank you yep that's just to narrow the base of support let's see where did I leave off here we go Okay, we're back on. Everybody seeing this again? Hopefully. Yes. So how how is the lumbopelvic region different from other regions? Well, if we look at the um, kind of the morphological makeup of the um, lumbar segments themselves, right? It's does it, they're much more robust. They're thicker. Um, they're designed for vertical loading. Right. When we look at things like uh, certain cervical segments, we have things like the U joints. Um, when we look at thoracic segments, we can actually get clefting um, in between the discs and such to facilitate rotation of those segments. Lumbar spine is much more robust. It's designed to go forward and backward um, and essentially resist rotation. Um, we'll talk about that here in a second a bit more, but um, definitely thicker. We have a, a bigger um, canal for the neurological structures for the cauda equina. Um, and when we look at, so if we start to look at the orientation of the facet joints, they are in the sagittal plane, meaning if we were to, the, the facet joints will either face medi medially or laterally. So the, the plane of the joints is in the sagittal plane as far as movement. Um, there is uh, a slight curvature on the anterior portion of the superior, superior portion of the inferior segment. I'm gonna say that again, because that's a, that's a tough process. If we're looking at say L4 sitting on L5, the superior articular facets of L5, okay, will have a slight curvature to them um, that allows them to resist anterior shearing. Okay, so if you want to see what that looks like. So we have the two, this would be the set, the facets on the um, articular facets on L5, and then L4 would fit inside that. Um, the L5 superior facets here have a little curvature to them like this. So if L4 is starting to slide forward, it's just another um, kind of safeguard for anterior translation um, with uh, forward flexion. Now, the other thing that will happen with those is if we get into a hyperextension position, so if we go into excessive lumbar lordosis, is as those segments, so if this is L5 and this is as L4, if we go into extension, we're going to impact that and we can get some hinging to occur. Um, that actually is actually a relatively useful thing. If we have a patient that has an anterior, uh, like a listhesis, uh, spondy, but the neural arch is intact. We don't have a pars fracture or anything of those uh, in, along those lines. We can use that extension mechanism there with that hinging to help pull that superior segment posteriorly. Um, I was in a clinic once with uh, Earl Petman um, back when I was doing my fellowship work and he had a patient that came in and the guy couldn't have looked more like a disc lesion. Um, barely stand up, you know, pain going down one of the legs. It, it just, it, or sorry, couldn't sit down, couldn't stand up. It was, you know, all antalgic shifted, um, you know, neurological symptoms into the limb. It was, it, it looked so cut and dry that this thing was a uh, disc protrusion uh, or a herniation for that matter. We'll talk more about those classifications as we go along here as well. Um, and so Earl, you know, being the clinician that he is says, well, what we have to do here, it doesn't matter really where this thing is or what it's doing. We have to get you into a prone extension protocol. 
um, to compress the posterior elements, so compress the posterior portion of the disc. We, um, like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about the methods of this, but when we do that, what we get is we get an increased hydrostatic pressure, right? So it's almost like a hydraulic type of pressure. Um, and what it'll do is it'll overcome osmotic pressure, basically the pressure from inflammatory fluids um, in that area. So as it kind of squeezes that, it's going to push the fluids, the inflammatory fluids uh, back into the drainage mechanisms and the vertebral spongiosa. And so it gets that irritating kind of caustic inflammatory exudate away from the nerve tissues. So that's the plan anyway, as we're going into this patient lays down on the table, flat on his belly, Earl um, goes to lift the, the head of the table up or the, the you know, you guys know how the, the tables move like that uh, to hinge him backward. And there's this really loud cavitation, this big, loud popping sound. And the patient just goes, oh, and all of the neurological symptoms disappeared just like that. Um, so what he actually had was a guillotine lesion where the segment had shifted forward so far that it was compressing the nerve root in, in the foramen. And when he put him into that extension position, we got this hinging moment that occurred um, via that, that curvature on those superior articular facets. And it just shifted the whole thing straight backward, popped it right back into place. And so all of that neurological compression just disappeared instantly. Um, probably the easiest treatment Earl Petman has ever done in his entire life. Um, you know, barring that he had to go through then and look at stability training and figuring out how, how we, uh, how did this segment start to break down and become so unstable to begin with? Um, but kind of fell into it by accident, but it does work that way. Okay. So that's the orientation of the facets. Obviously we're going to have thicker discs. We were talking about that. They won't have the same type of potential for clefting that we have um, around the U joints or around some of the thoracic segments, um, that facilitate rotation. Um, we were talking about this here, the resistance to rotation. There's a lot of different structures that do that. Um, the annular fibers are one of the major ones. I actually think from a percentage perspective, the longitudinal ligaments supposedly are the, are the greatest resistor to rotational movements. I think that's a, it, based on some study, um, but these these things, the neural arch um, and the associated musculature, all these things allow the lumbar spine to resist rotation. Okay, so what what is that? What's the purpose of that? Essentially, the thought is is that if we twist the lumbar spine, right, we get this and we start to torsion this, but there's a lot of resistance, a lot of uh, potentially pliable tissues here that start to become tensed very early in that rotational movement when they release they'll release with a very effective spring, right? So we'll get a lot of energy generated because of the resistance to rotation there through the lumbar segments, okay? Um, neurologically, in the lumbar spine, we are not dealing with the spinal cord. Spinal cord tends to end around uh, T12, L1, somewhere in that general vicinity. Um, so we will not be getting upper motor neuron symptoms from a central lesion. Now, uh, caught aquina syndrome is not it's a peripheral lesion um, because of the, the end of the of the spinal cord there um, but it's still a, considered a very serious medical emergency you need to get somebody that has symptoms of caught aquina um, in to see in probably into the emergency room very quickly because within I think the number is 48 to 72 hours any particular changes that may have occurred um, particularly for uh, bowel and bladder function will become permanent um, so make sure that we are able to recognize that. And we have a slide on that later on here as well. So um, the angulations of the nerve roots are steeper, right? So we talked about in, or at least we should have been talking about it in module one, but I know we talked about it when I was there for module three. Um, if we have more than one level in the cervical spine affected, as far as neurological deficits go, that's a red flag, right? More than one. Um, but in the lumbar spine, if we have three or more, we got a question. No. Okay. Um, if we have three or more in the lumbar spine, that's a red flag and it's due to the angulation of the nerve roots. So in the cervical spine, they come out more like this, um, with less of a slope in the lumbar spine, because we're coming down through the cauda equina, they, they have a much steeper slope to them. Um, and that can affect which levels are 
impacted by various uh, lesions at different at different levels. Essentially, we could have, um, you know, say L5 um, radiculopathy from a disc lesion that's at L3 because it's coming down from above. Um, and as it passes by that disc lesion at L3, it can create um, that ridic those radicular symptoms. Okay, so we just have to remember that three or more in the lumbar spine, two or more in the cervical spine are considered red flags. All right, so these are just, you know, kind of some basic considerations that we have to take into, um, that we have to think about when we're going through our, our process of examination here, things like systemic inflammatory conditions. Um, realistically, we should think about these anytime we deal with spinal segments, um, particularly if they have a real gross distribution, um, bilateral distributions, things of that sort of nature. Um, but rheumatoid arthritis, um, it's actually an inflammatory reaction of the synovium. Um, Anky spond um, probably is going to affect the rib cage more than anything else, but in, especially in women, we will have the SI joint affected. Um, so that's another thing that we have to consider. Writer's syndrome, no, I actually don't even think it's called writer's syndrome anymore. I think it's called reactive arthritis. Um, because apparently the writer, whoever it was that described this uh, syndrome is uh, was a Nazi. So they decided they didn't like that. Um, so if you hear it referred to as reactive arthritis or writer's syndrome, um, those are the two, those are the same thing. And basically what that implies is that we have an inflammatory process that began in one region of the body um, and it then produces a systemic response. Um, I saw this once in a woman... Oh God, it was one of the worst things I ever had to deal with. Um, fell, broke her uh, olecranon, right? Fell on the point of her elbow, fractured her elbow. Surgery to repair it, all this stuff. And so she comes in and it was it was weeks after the actual injury. Um, for whatever reason, the surgeon told her she probably wouldn't need physical therapy after the fact, which seems completely like lunacy to me. How are you going to get range of motion back in a casted elbow? Um, so anyway, she she finally came in. We had to do a lot of work on trying to get the elbow moving, but what we ended up having and finding was that she also had then a um, frozen shoulder start to develop. So she ended up with a very uh, serious inflammatory reaction of the glenohumeral joint on that side. And then in the midst of going through and working on both the elbow and then on the shoulder, um, she started having hip pain as well, which turned out to be a capsular issue, an inflammatory issue. Um, long story short, this woman ended up having to have both the shoulder and the hip replaced, um, as a result of this reactive arthrosis or arthritis that, that kind of hit her, um, you know, weeks, months down the line. So it was brutal. Um, and the worst part about it was, was she was on Medicare. Uh, so when we, when we were starting to say, okay, we, we can work on the shoulder. I can relate that a little bit to the elbow, um, you know, and saying that, that it's cause that the elbow is causing problems around the shoulder and I can make some, I can make some things up there to, to make that happen. But when we start looking at the hip, we'd already burned through, we, you know, we're using, um, what are they called? The exemption codes for the, for the elbow and whatnot to go beyond the cap. We couldn't do any of that with her hip because it was completely separate diagnosis. Um, so she had this surgery done and we couldn't even do any rehab for it. It was just dreadful having to deal with this. Um, so writer's syndrome is a, a reactive arthritis is a, is a very difficult thing to talk about. It's a difficult thing to deal with when you, when you see it, uh, cause you just never really know when something else is going to be, uh, <laughs> kind of snapping and giving you problems. Um, you see ulcerative colitis, um, will again present with systemic arthro arthritic, uh, changes. Um, the thing that will tend to separate that from any of the other three above it will be that there's usually going to be some associated um, gastrointestinal problems that come along with it. Um, so typically they'll have flare-ups of joint issues along with flare-ups of stomach and um, GI issues. Okay, so um, psoriatic arthritis is something that I haven't seen a ton of, um, at least not actively as a diagnosis that we've had to treat. Um, but essentially it's, it's plaque buildup within the joints and it, it irritates the same joints the same way as most of the other inflammatory conditions do. The top four there, um, they, oop, sorry. They will all have um, some sort of reaction 
elsewhere in the body outside of the joints. They'll present with this. So if you look down here on the notes, this triad of conjunctivitis, so irritation of the eyes, urethritis, so this is kind of like a burning when they urinate, and then fasciitis, which tends to be systemic, tends to be bilateral. So things in the palms of the hands, both sides of the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, um, over the lumbar area where the uh, thoracolumbar fascia is, all these sort of things. So you can ask people about these things. It's actually, a, when, if you see somebody coming in that has, you know, what you're, what you're considering potentially to be a systemic issue, um, it's a good idea to ask them about these other things. Do you have issues with your eyes? Do you have issues when you, when you urinate, do you have issues with the, um, you know, these fascial areas? Um, so it's, it's, um, helpful cause it's actually helped me catch a few of these things, um, that we've then had to send patients off to get tested for. And once we found them then they're able to get medicated and we we're able to kind of work with it a little bit better. Okay. Um, tumors, obviously these are never a good thing. Um, but, if we start to have air, uh, forbidden area pain, this is like upper lumbar pain. Um, that's just not normal. In some cases, I think some PTs look at that as almost a red flag in and of itself. Um, but basically that's going to be the most common area for metastases to develop. Um, so we have to be aware and conscientious of that, especially if they have a history of cancer, um, particularly of like the lungs, things of that sort of nature. Um, just because the lymphatic drainage kind of gets into that particular area. So again, like I said, most common region for bony metastases. Sign of the buttock. Um, we talked about this a bit um, in the peripheral course. Basically, it's a loss of any type of hip flexion, um, whether the knee is straight or bent. Um, it doesn't make any difference. Um, so straight leg raise or with the knee flexed trunk flexion where you're actually hinging at the hips going forward. Um, you'll get weakness, probably painful weakness of the hip extensors. So the glutes, you'll potentially get either atrophy or swelling of the glutes, depending on what, uh, what the main cause of that is. Um, and again, this is, this is where we see, uh, what we call an empty end feel, right? So it, it's not that the actual, there's some tissue limiting the range of motion. It's just that the, the range of motion kind of stops because it's too painful for the patient to go any further. Um, so you don't ever appreciate any actual end feel. Um, you know, what what sort of things will cause this sort of stuff? I think I have a list down here. Yeah, so ileorectal abscesses, so infections, tumors, um, all again on the posterior aspects of the hip, infectious sacroiliitis. I had one once was a woman that had, uh, I think, did I tell you guys this story? I think I told you this story, um, where there was a hole in the plastic cap for the acetabulum after she had a hip replacement. And so she ended up getting um, like rust developing on the, um, metal femoral, femoral head. And so she ended up with blood poisoning. Um, but that's the only time I've ever seen, um, a sign of the buttock that I can think of off the top of my head now, but it was pretty kind of scary, you know, looking at it. I did see one in the shoulder once, um, not a sign of the buttock, but an empty end feel in the shoulder that was, that was due to a, um, significant inflammatory or bursitis. So inflammation of the sub, uh, subdeltoid bursa. Um, that was a good one. Questions about any of that stuff? No? Eric, kind of backing up when you're talking about the articular pillars of the lumbar spine, and you mentioned there being some curvature, are we talking about there's like convexity and concavity of the articulating, you know, inferior facet of L4 on the superior facet of L5? No. So it would be, it's not a convexity or concavity. It's not, uh, it, it's a planar joint. It just has this little like hook to it like that. Um, so when the other, when the other articular component from the other vertebra, the superior uh, vertebra. So if this is L5's superior articular facet, and this is L4's inferior articular facet, this L4 sits inside L5 and we get this little hook. And so that's just to help resist um, anterior translation, help with hinging backwards so that we don't, um, you know, create any other issues with um, some of the tension on the longitudinal ligaments and whatnot. Um, but it's not what what you'd call a convexity or concavity. It, it's a planar joint just with this little kind of nub on the end where it, it kind of tilts inward. Now, they say it can either be C-shaped or L-shaped, but it, usually when you look at it, it's going to look like that. 
Does that make sense? Yes, got it. Thank you. Okay, good. What do we got next? Aha. So primary lumbar pathology. This is one of the things, obviously, that can affect the lumbopelvic mechanism. It makes sense because the lumbar is part of the lumbopelvic mechanism. But it's also can the, any one of these things can also cause issues within the pelvis itself. Um, and we'll talk more specifically about how those things do that um, when we get into the actual course. Um, primary lumbar pathology is probably the most consistent cause of sacral torsions. Um, I don't know if any if any of you guys have heard that term before. Um, basically, the sacrum is just a, it's just a continuation of the lumbar spine, right? So we tend we have to tend to think of uh, the sacrum as just the the next vertebra in line, um, but it operates on a different um, vector than the rest of the lumbar spine, right? So if if this is my tailbone here we go on these oblique vectors like this, where they come from the uh, base on one base of the uh, sacrum on one side, and then comes down toward the inferior lateral angle on the opposite side. And so what it, what it does, if we're going on this plane, like that, then the pelvis is gonna, the tailbone is gonna move like this, okay? It's not gonna just do this. It's capable of doing this, but with oblique ac activities like gait, we're going to get these oblique movements through the sacrum. Um, in my experience, I more commonly see sacral torsion pathology, um, meaning dysfunction through the sacrum um, in that torsional vector due to primary lumbar pathology. And it's mostly because of how it affects the musculature around the lumbar region and down into the pelvis. Um, like I said, we'll talk more about that when we get into the course itself, the, the in-person portion of the course, because um, it is a little complicated. It's easier for me to kind of show it to you with, with gait and whatnot than it is to demonstrate anything here over the Zoom. But um, realistically, there's kind of only three significant major types of pathology that we see in the lumbar region, which sounds very simplified and probably is to some extent. Um but this, these are essentially the three major things that we'll see, right? So disc pathology um, is the first one, most obvious one. Um, there are various types and different categorizations of these things. So if we go down here to the um, notes on the bottom, a herniation, which I don't know about you guys, when I get referrals from physicians, everything that they think has a disc issue is a herniation. Um it just says HNP of whatever level they think it's at. Um, and it, But unfortunately, herniation specifically implies a migration of the nuclear material or of some type of material. Um, in, the, in the lumbar segments, it would be migration of the nuclear material of the disc. Um, these things can either be external, where we've actually had um, fissures in the annular fibers um, where the nuclear material will uh, extrude out um, into the into the neural canal and whatnot or any type any area around the uh, around the disc itself um, or it could be contained meaning that the annular fibers are still intact and the nucleus itself has just kind of shifted or there's been a movement of some of that um, some of that tissue in a, in a particular direction those can be very painful depending on what causes them um, we can also have vertical or um, herniations where they actually go upward and or downward into the um, vertebral body. Those are called schmoral snubs. Those can also be very painful. Um, essentially, they're end plate fractures. Um, the problem with that is that tends to introduce blood into the disc, and blood is very uh, chemotaxic for the disc material. Um, it tends to chew it right up. Um, so a lot of times when we see end plate fractures, these are the ones that we'll see that have very substantial um, kind of presenting symptoms you know, because that blood is just tearing up what's left of that disc material. Tends to be that younger uh, herniations in younger patient clientele are worse um, because there's a higher content of proteoglycans with still within the disc and that's the stuff that's vulnerable to the inflammatory exudate. Uh, so it'll chew that stuff up real bad and so we get a much more exaggerated inflammatory uh, response as a result. 
um, versus somebody that's significantly older and the disc has become more fibrous um, and has lost some of that proteoglycan content. If we get a um, herniation there or an in-plate lesion there, um, it's not going to have the same significant inflammatory reaction just because the type of tissue that it would need to do that has started to fibrose. Okay. Um, but if we look down further here, we start to see things like protrusion, prolapse, extrusion, and sequestration. So these are all different versions of disc lesions, right? So protrusion essentially is we just have annular fibers protruding out into the space. Um, prolapse is a little bit more involved with that where we may have um, nuclear material within that uh, protrusion. Um, and extrusion essentially is when some of these, uh, either the annular fibers or potentially some of the nuclear uh, material has exited the disc. Um, very significant, obviously more cases of um, surgical intervention needs to be done um, in things like extrusions. And sequestrations is the same thing as an extrusion, except now the nuclear material or the disc material is not just in the local um, canal, it's actually migrated up or down um, within the canal causing issues elsewhere. So again, very likely with these last two that we're going to end up needing surgical intervention to get those things uh, fixed. Okay. Um, instability is a, unfortunately, kind of a catch-all term in some literature. Um, we can call it segmental dysfunction. Um, I think we tend to prefer that sort of definition um, when we're looking at diagnosis, right? So if we're looking at, you know, what tissue it is that's actually causing pain, um, segmental dysfunction would be a better answer than instability for us. Um, not that a segmental dysfunction can't be an instability. That's actually another, it's just a type of inst a type of segmental dysfunction. But we could also have a sublux facet joint. We could also have a, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? An arthritic or arthrotic uh, facet joint, any of those sort of things, old disc lesions, those sort of things could be considered segmental dysfunctions. Um, neural arch defects is another big one. Um, the one that I usually like to talk about the most during this class is um, the potential for um, segmental shifts. Um, so we talked about in module three, so in the thoracic course, the idea of lateral shifts, anterior shifts, things of that sort of nature. And those things can happen um, in the lumbar spine as well. And they tend to be some of the worst things that'll walk into the door. Um, I've had one of these things multiple times and it is absolutely debilitating. Um, can't lay down, can't sit, can't walk, can't get in and out of bed. It's just absolutely dreadful because everything just goes absolutely nuts when this happens. Um, but it is a fixable problem, which is nice. So lateral shifts are the ones that I tend to see most consistently where we have a segment that's kind of tilted off to a side like this. Um, there's a few things that can cause that. Um, for me, um, for my patient population, with a lot of runners, with a lot of people that play rotational weekend warrior sports like golfing and playing softball, where there's a lot of twisting. Um, I'd say the most common issue that sets one of these off is a lateral shift or some sort of rotational limitation in the thorax. Um, so the idea being if I can't turn to my left, right, when I'm swinging a golf club during my follow through, we know that what should happen throughout the segments of the spine is we should get a contralateral translation of those segments, right? So we know that from the thoracic region when we were looking at those. Um, so if I turn left, all the thoracic segments should, should translate to the right. It's the same thing that happens in the lumbar spine. Now, in theory, um, and I can't stress that enough, in theory, um, the lumbar segments should be stable enough not to allow this sort of translational shift. Um, so what it suggests is that there has already been some structural breakdown at that involved segment, um, which in general tends to be the case. If we have if we have a patient that's rotating um, repetitiously, um, you know, say say a patient plays golf once a week, you know, they hit a bunch of balls on the range before they go out on the course. They're kind of the average golfer. They're swinging the club between ninety and one hundred and ten times. Um, high velocity, and we're not able to do that rotational movement effectively through the rib cage or distribute that rotational motion effectively through the rib cage, um, 
we got to adapt to that somewhere. And where that tends to happen is in the lumbar spine. Now, the lumbar spine, we know is designed to resist rotation. But if it's taking excessive rotary forces, eventually it will start to break down. Right, we'll start to get damage to the neural arch. We'll start to get damage to the annular fibers, the longitudinal ligaments. We'll get damage to the facet joint mechanisms. All of these sort of things will start to break down, and then we start to develop some laxity. And then once there's enough laxity, we can get this thing to shift. Um, not pleasant. It sucks. As a matter of fact, <laughs> pardon my bluntness with that, but it's it's a tough one. Um, the only other thing. So if we want to look at kind of the what would the presentation look like for a lateral shift um, in the lumbar spine? Um, I would say moderate to very severe pain um, tends to be central um, within the spine. Um, very little referral. Um, so very little peripheral referral. We may get some discomfort into the glute region, um, but very little into the legs. Um, we get uh, typically catching movements. Um, when they when they try and um, go from, you know, sitting to standing, or, uh, sitting to supine, any of those sort of things, one of the most um, pathonomic things or diagnostic things that I've found with these lateral shifts is when a patient goes from sitting to standing, they will feel like they can't get their hips underneath them. Okay, and the reason for that is the insane spasm that we get through the psoas major. Okay, that thing will just absolutely anchor down and it won't let you go. So when you stand, you can't get your hips to shift underneath you like you normally would. So it kind of feels like it's pushing you forward. Um, that's another question I typically ask patients when I'm suspicious of one of these things. Um, is when you're walking, does it feel like you're you're being your chest is out in front of your uh, hips? And and that again suggests that that uh, psoas has tightened up to the point where it's not allowing um, the person to kind of sit back into their hips there and allowing good adequate. Uh, movement of the lumbar segments. And again, that's a protective mechanism. The body does that on purpose to try and prevent us from moving too much and damaging anything else any further. Um, so again, we should have uh, facilitatory effects in that, in that particular segment. I've seen it be unilateral and I've seen it be bilateral. Um, bilateral, essentially, if we're looking at it, this is an intersegmental issue. Um, so it could affect both sides. Now, I have had patients in the past where we get a significant shift and we get some tension through some of the neurological structures and we get some referenced pain as a result of that. You have to take each individual um, situation for what it's worth when they walk into the clinic. So it's possible. It's just not very common. The common presentation is no reference into the limb. Um, what else do we get? When we look at them, they're going to look like they have a disc lesion. They're going to be shifted. They're going to be, you know, so if their hips are um, straight up and down here, you're going to notice somebody's kind of tilted in one direction. And if we try and do a standing shift correction, basically grab onto one shoulder, grab onto the other hip, and we try and shear them across, try and correct that sort of thing, um, we should feel a very distinct lack of mobility in that sort of in that sort of situation. And we should be able to predict these things. Um, which directions they should be in based off of where is the rotational restriction, right? So if it's on, if the rotational restriction is on the left, we'd expect them not to be able to shift well to the left because it would have been pushed to the right with all that left rotation, limited left rotation, okay? Um, it is possible to have shifts occur as a result of leg length discrepancies. Um, so if we have a loss of hip extension on one side, or a loss of ankle dorsiflexion on one side, or maybe a loss of uh, anterior nominate rotation potentially on one side, it can create a shift. Um, essentially, as the, the pelvis starts to tilt, we'll start to get these sort of things where the, the lumbar segments will have to adapt, and we can get a shift as a result of that. Um, I think Jim sees that more commonly than, or did, um, when, he was, when he was seeing a lot of patients in clinic. Um, than the thoracic stuff. Again, I think it may be based off of clientele and the type of population you see. Um, I would say an older population is probably more likely to have the um, lower extremity issues because of things like arthrosis to the hips and whatnot um, versus somebody that's more young and active and does a lot of rotational activities as a, as a um, hobby. They're more likely to have the thoracic stuff. Okay, so those are very difficult. The only 
um, differential diagnosis. So the only other lesion that might confuse you um, compared to a lateral shift is a contained disc herniation. Because um, again, if it's contained, it's not going to be impacting any of the neurological structures. It's going to tend to be very central. We're going to have that same type of spasm going on um, of the psoas in order to kind of deviate from wherever that that herniation is. Um, you know, so if it's going to the left, but it's not exiting, it's not affecting the the annular fibers. They're still intact. They're going to lean away from that sort of damaged tissue. Um, so we're still going to see that shift. Um, the biggest difference that we will find is as soon as we start to try and do a shift correction, it's going to hurt. It's going to make it worse because um, essentially what we're doing is we're shifting them back over that herniation, putting their body weight down on it, and that's going to essentially light them up. Um, so you would expect no pain with a um, lateral shift when we're doing a shift correction, and we would expect significant pain if it was a uh, contained herniation, and that will significantly guide your uh, treatment protocol. Okay, and we'll talk more about how do we treat this thing and how do we, you know, confirm these things and whatnot um, as we go along. The next one here, neural arch defects. So these are your pars fractures, your lamina fractures, things of that sort of nature. Um, very substantial um, because they destabilize the neural arch itself. Um, that's one of the major restraints for rotation. Um, it is possible based off of a neural arch fracture. So if it's a pars fracture where we have the neural top of the neural foramen, so say we have a fracture right through the top of that and the nerve root goes right underneath that, the fracture can create enough inflammation to create a radiculopathy. That's going to look very similar to a disc lesion. Um, but what we would expect to see is we would expect to see increased pain with rotation, but not with compression, right? Because the PARS is not a vertical loading structure. Um, so our usual compression tests, things of that sort of nature would be negative. Um, they may not mind sitting as much as a typical disc patient, um, but they would be significantly worse with rotation. And it's not that a disc lesion wouldn't be worse with rotation, um, but it would be also worse with compression and, and multiple other movements, right? So um, that is something to pay attention to because the rotary component, we would then have to work on correcting that, get away from a prone extension protocol um, because it's essentially not going to work on, on the neural arch, okay? Um, and then the last thing, stenosis, um, we have lateral versus central. Um, everybody's seen stenosis patients, I'm sure. What we tend to see from a, a sequela perspective is if somebody in their youth, so say up to their mid-20s, has a disc herniation, right? And they do not rehab that disc appropriately. But eventually the inflammation dies down. They end up with, um, you know, relieved sciatic pain. You know, sciatic pain goes away and you know, maybe they don't have any neurological symptoms anymore, but, and they're kind of going along with their life, but they don't do any type of rehab for this. What eventually will happen is that disc will start to degenerate and degenerative changes or early de degenerative changes to the disc will then create a instability. Okay. We move down the chain here and that's, as that starts to break down instability, as these segments start to bang around, right. And they're kind of sloppy. They're all over the place. They're not being controlled well by the segmental multifidi uh, musculature. Um, so we're just banging into those end range structures, um, whether that's the joints themselves, the disc uh, annular fibers, et cetera, whatever, whatever structure it is, those things are going to start to scar down. They're going to start to fibrose. And the more and more that that happens, the more scar tissue builds up, and then eventually they will progress to a stenosis. Um, so again, these things tend to waterfall if they're left alone, um, which is not good. Now, stenosis, especially lateral stenosis, um, you tend to see it more consistently in the older patient, right? Um, tends to be worse with walking, tends to be worse with, you know, s prolonged standing positions, things of that sort of nature. They sit down, they, they, the symptoms tend to dissipate. Um, you can see this in younger clientele. I saw this in a guy that was about 32, um, he had a very substantial disc lesion 
um, at one point. They went in and they did just a discectomy and just kind of cut out all the all the stuff. But the disc started just breaking down like crazy. Um, and so he developed some very substantial scar tissue um, in that segment. And it eventually developed into what looked like, you know, an, an old person's lateral stenosis. Um, the plus side with that is if you get to it early enough, you can actually do a gapping manipulation to essentially tear through those fibers and open up that space. Um, and it usually relieves the patient's discomfort immediately, which is great. So that's what we did with him. We had to do that with him a couple of, like once every couple of months um, for about a year, I would say, maybe maybe 14 months, something like that. Uh, this is a while ago now, but um, eventually once the stability training that we put him on um, started to take effect, we were able to limit the amount of scar tissue that built up and he did very well. Um, so you just have to be able to engage that type of end feel. And again, we'll show you how to do that technique um, when we get into um, the on-site course. Okay. Um, I think I talked a lot about some of this stuff here. Um, there's some more specifics on responses to motion and posture and whatnot that we will talk about. Um, I don't know what Dave or Jim have planned potentially for next week, um, but we can go in and kind of finish up that stuff. Or if we need to, we can finish it up on Friday afternoon of the course, depending on how we want to go, go forward with this stuff. But I'm going to stop there for today um, before starting in on anything else. Do we have any questions? And yes, Ariel, we do have, you guys should be able to have access to this, this uh, uh, PowerPoint because Dave specifically requested this one. So I know he at least has it somewhere. So I don't know if I didn't look at the website. I don't know if it's up there, but if not, let Dave know and he can, he can get it up it's there. On there. It's under N5. Great. Good. That's what it should be. Um, and again, this, this stuff is, it's in depth, right? And I, I tend to think that the pelvis mechanism, um, how we view it and how we look at how it is affected by various other parts of the body, it is uh, difficult, right? Um, so the one thing that you have to look at here um, that I will tell you is pretty universally, if you have an SI joint dysfunction, if a patient comes in with pelvis pain, you know, so they have a positive Fortin's point where they're pointing right at it and they say, this is where it hurts. Um, if they have that presentation, pretty universally, it's not a primary problem, meaning it didn't just decide to become a problem on its own. Um, so you're going to be looking for a secondary problem, something that's affecting the SI joint and starting to break it down. Now, whether that's a lumbar issue, a thoracic issue, a hip issue, a lower extremity issue, any of these things can cause problems in there and create pain responses. Um, outside of a couple of, um, what I call them, exceptions, pregnant females, kids under the age of 12 where the joint has, hasn't fully formed yet, or patients with really significant uh, systemic inflammatory conditions that have chewed up the articular cartilage inside that joint. Those are kind of the three major um, exceptions to that rule where they can have primary sacroiliac dysfunction that's not directly resulting from something else um, elsewhere. There's a fourth one that some people uh, like to trumpet a little bit with uh, severe trauma, like getting run over by a car. Um, but I would argue that you're more likely to fracture the pelvis um, than you are to, you know, dislocate the SI joint um, just because of how stable it is. But again, we'll talk more about the stability and morphology of the SI joint as we get into the course. Okay. Questions, questions. there's nothing, then we will see you guys finish this up maybe next week. Okay. All right. See you then.